it's not a great environment right now. Uh, we'll go through some of these. Uh, markets in play are the Mexican peso. That's one that we're watching really closely. And uh, still the, the short yen, which you can see the short yen through the short yen future, long euro yen, long the pound yen, long the CAD yen, and long the Swiss yen. Um, and then in the fixed income, fixed income is still weak. We have the high, entire U.S. curve is still pushing down. Uh, interest rates are still moving higher. Starting to see some big divergences there that we'll talk about in a little bit, but that is still in play. Uh, NASDAQ and big tech especially are weak. Heating oil is very strong. Soybean oil is strong. Coffee is weak. And then in the sectors, the XLE is super strong. Several energy stocks are making new highs. That's really the only sector that's really standing out as strong. And then on the weakness, we have XLY, XLC, and XLK. Now, they, they are still all weak. So in terms of what WAM relative strength, there was a, a big shift in equities in the month of October. So we've had a big shift. You can see the Dow especially really took off. And the Dow benefits when the dollar starts to weaken. And we had some dollar weakness that really allowed the Dow to really kind of launch. So it had a wham relative strength change of 52. And then the Russell and the S&Ps were behind it. And as we said, the, the Dow was able to rally in part because the dollar index actually, and the dollar actually weakened. So in sector ETFs, as we said, XLE is really strong. It's really the only one that's strong. And on the, weak, on the weak side, we have XLC, we have XLY, and XLK. Uh, the VXX has remained near yearly lows, which is pretty amazing, considering we're not that far from the lows. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mark. Sounds good. Hey, can you see my screen? Yeah, and if you can, uh, why? I'll, I'll zoom it. I'll zoom. Thank you. Sure. Okay. All right. So I, we, it's from a macro perspective, kind of we're still in this same situation where here's our market neutral rate, which has now gone up to 4.66%, the two-year treasury yield, and Fed funds are, are not there yet. And usually they get, they rise above the market neutral rate, whether that market neutral rate is heading down to make them go above or not, it just depends on the cycle. But basically, they're usually 50 basis points above the two-year yield before we get a real shift in where the Fed funds are going and in the cycle. And we're not there. So, and the other thing I think is really important to understand, we'll talk about a little bit later, but if you're in a bull market, and it's a big correction, like a 2018 uh, is a great example, late 2018, still in a bull market, everything's still bullish. You're not going into recession, most likely. There's not a lot of indications that you are. You haven't had a lot of your uh, bull market top checklist go off, all these things that tell you there's a recession coming. Then looking for a Fed pivot makes sense. Looking for a Fed pivot could get you a nice, nicking at the bottom, which is which is what we did on that uh, Christmas decline. But that's different story when you're in a bear market and when you have a lot of signals of recession, then just looking for a Fed pivot doesn't do it. It doesn't put in bottoms historically. Historically, what you need when you're in a bear market and a bear market accompanied by a recession, you need both 10-year rates to peak 10-year bonds to bottom and start to turn up, usually at least two months and often more, and you need the Fed funds rate to actually be cut. And a lot of times it's cut multiple times before the market actually begins to turn around. So what I want you to understand is from a macro perspective, we're not anywhere close to where they, you would expect a Fed pivot, and we're in an environment where a Fed pivot is meaningless. It's a good story for a bear rally that will then get 
knocked down by either the Fed or by some sort of a development that shows the recession is building. And a lot of times what happens at the beginning of a bear market is there's an obsession with what the Fed is doing that then shifts later when you start to get a recession that really develops all of a sudden, the market is not focusing on the Fed anymore. They're focusing on how deep is this recession going to get? How much unemployment are we going to get? How much close? How close to a default crisis are we going to get? All those things is where focus usually is at the end of bear markets, not on whether the Fed's going to calm down from going 75 point basis points a shot to 50. It's really pretty meaningless in a major bear market. The other thing you want to really be watching and keep your eye on, this is the central market right now. Bonds, long rates, short rates. This is where you really want to be focusing your attention. And what I want you to see is on a secular basis, we have broken above a downtrend line that's been in place since the 1980s. So we're in a secular uptrend in interest rates, something that has not been the case since the early 1980s. That means you want to be much more careful about any kind of buying bonds, and you want to consider the main trend up in rates. If you can see the TNX doesn't really have any kind of major resistance, so about 5.3 to 5.5, we're not there yet. And you want, and looking at it on a daily basis, this is a monthly chart going back to the 90s, and you, you, this trend line goes back all, all the way to the early 80s, 84. Uh, and But if you look at the daily chart, it's just grinding higher. And when you have a market rally in stocks that's not really well received by bonds, that's likely short cycle life uh, on that, and it's going to run out. Eventually, if bonds keep going higher, they're going to knock the legs out from under any equity rally, even one that's based on an election result that could be positive for the market short term. All right. The other thing to realize that's different this time, how you want to calibrate, you kind of want a lot of times with what you're doing with macro analysis, you're trying to figure out what is the correct context? How should I be viewing the action? Right. And the correct context, I think right now we've had almost all of our, our bear market warnings go off. Our, our model suggests that there's close to 100% chance of recession. And here are two of them in the yield curve. The yield curve for the three month 10 year and the yield curve for the two year 10 year. Both are inverted since World War II. Every time both have been inverted, a recession has followed with 100% reliability. And we've talked about why that's the case. What an inverted yield curve does is it makes it completely unprofitable for banks to borrow short term and lend long term because the short term rate is higher. There's no margin for borrowing short term and lending long. And so what happens when you get a yield curve that's inverted is that bank lending starts to come to a, a crawl or, and even go negative sometimes. So that when, what that does is that affects the cycle a year, 18 months down the road. And it means that we're still in a situation where a year down the road, things are going to get softer because there's no bank lending happening. And there's not going to be until that yield curve steepens. The other thing I just keep pointing out, again, in a bear market accompanied by a recession, bond rates peak before the market bottoms repeatedly, everyone since World War II. And guess what? The Fed fund rate has been cut before those bottoms as well. So, so, what, so really what you want to kind of do is focus on rates a bit because we're in a situation where the yield curve and all of our indicators are telling us recession is virtually assured. Whether we've had one or not is debatable. Before the Biden administration, the definition of a recession was two negative quarters of GDP, and we've already had that. We have recession in Europe. It looks like it's going to be a global recession. We have the worst inflation shock since the 1970s, and in some ways, it's worse. It's a big supply problem that we've talked about a lot. 
We also have all kinds of different shocks that have hit the economy. Uh, we have labor shortages. We have all just all kinds of shortages of raw materials because we're actually doing a trade war against China and we're doing a proxy World War III against Russia right now that's killing a lot of the whole production cycle and where things were, were garnered, where they were built, how they were shipped, all that stuff is really changing. It's a huge shock. To think that we're not going to have probably a deep recession, I would say is quite optimistic. So focus on rates because rates go before stocks when you're in a, a bear market accompanied by recession. And this isn't just in this since the 1990s. If you look in the 1970s, you also have rates peaking in front of every single recession bottom. And you had the Fed funds rate coming down before that bottomed happened. So the market, you'll listen to the news and everybody's talking about a pivot. Pivot doesn't mean shit in a bear market in recession. It doesn't. It means bear rally, if anything. What really matters is when rates actually turn both long term and short term, and you start getting signals of capitulation that are substantial. What you'd have also noticed the last time we had inflation getting anywhere near this level, we had the Dow Jones Industrial Average going essentially looks like a heart monitor. Right, it's going sideways and it doesn't really, it inches to new highs but comes back down, doesn't go anywhere for 16, 17 years. Usually you have unemployment popping up when you get a recession. That's one thing we haven't had. One of the reasons is we have a huge labor shortage. We have a, a demographic problem where the baby boomers are starting to retire in mass and we really don't have people to replace them. And we got a lot of people that retired early because of COVID, because they just said, forget it, it's not worth it. Uh, and they're not in the workforce. So we have this big labor, labor shortage, probably the most severe shortage we've had since World War II ended. We have immigration that we used to be, we had 10 million Mexicans coming in over the course of the cycle. We don't have that into the US economy anymore. In fact, they're leaving. And U.S. people are moving to Mexico because it's cheaper and they're, they're worried about problems in the United States. So it's interesting in North America, you have a ton of Canadians now moving to uh, the United States and Mexico and you got a ton of Americans moving to Mexico. But the point on unemployment is it's probably going to be lag. It's not going to be nearly the, what it is in a normal cycle because we have that labor shortage. But the Fed is likely to continue to tighten until they see wage rates comes down. And to get wage rates to come down, they have to see a much bigger pop in unemployment. That's going to be painful. Uh, the other thing to realize is when you're talking about a pivot where the Fed actually changes from raising rates, not just to leaving them flat like they were planning to do for nearly a year after they get them up, but actually cutting rates, when you get to that peak rate, that's actually when the stock markets tend to do their worst. That's when it's really clear to everybody, including the Fed, that recession is getting deeper and that they really can't keep raising rates without a real crisis. So what I want you to understand, you get about three months from actual peaks in rates, that's when the market tends to do the worst. There's a lot of statistics, and we've put a lot of them out as well, about how the market tends to do much better, uh, at, in a, especially in a presidential midterm, first term presidential midterm, in particular after the election is over, the uncertainty is removed, the market tends to do particularly well when the incumbent party is removed from power. So if you, if in that, in a midterm election, removed from power means controlling Congress and the Senate. So if we get a situation where the Republicans take over Congress, which I think is very likely, and the Senate, which I think is likely, both of those happening, the market's likely to get a sugar high off of that for a while. The problem is that even in after midterm election years, during recessions, market doesn't do that great in the fourth quarter like it normally does. And so eventually 
recession, earnings problems, something like that, or further inflation, further rate hiking, something is going to kick the legs out from under the rally most likely. 